have you ever noticed that uh, your, your cell phone only rings when you don't have time to talk? It's like you're busy, you're, you don't have time, and, and, and it just rings, it goes off. Or, or at dinner time, every time you sit down, and sometimes it's two or three times, like I've been home a couple hours, the phone is not rung. How do they know I'm about to eat dinner? Uh, but now with all that uh, scandal and surveillance stuff going on, maybe we know the answer to that. But, uh, oh, they're about to eat, let's ring that thing. Uh, or, you know, the car pulls up in your driveway, when? the end of a long day, you've got a big bowl of popcorn, it's still hot, and you've got a movie you just turned on, and people pull up in the driveway. And have you ever noticed, it's like none of these things happen when you plan them to. And it is easy to complain and grumble, even if it's like people you really like to see pulling up in the driveway. Oh, man, and, and it's easy to you just get off on that and to feel negative about that. But I've got a suspicion about my flesh. You know, the flesh is opposed to the spirit of God. The flesh is that selfish part in me. We're not talking about actual physical flesh, flesh. We're talking about the selfish part of our, of our nature, the self-centered part of our nature. I've got a suspicion about my flesh. And by the way, if you thought last week's message was easy, today's message, I think, is going to really challenge all of us. Uh, if it's not challenging you today, maybe it's because you're just really good at the Holy Spirit dodge. Here comes God, ole, you know, not going not to let God uh, impact us. I want to challenge us to be real with God and real with ourselves this morning and see what God can really do in people's hearts when we are honest with him. It's really easy for me to complain and moan and grumble when things are not convenient. When, let's face it, things, we're talking about people, right? When people that Jesus died for are not convenient. But I have this guess, this suspicion about my flesh. I think I'm onto something. The way my flesh thinks. When I'm busy, then I don't have time for an interruption. Interruption meaning people, right? I don't have time for an interruption. I'm busy. And when I'm not busy, when I have some of that rare free time, then when I'm interrupted, my fresh complains about that too because I already had other plans or, or maybe my plan was to have no plans or, oh, I've been busy all this time and now I'm just going to... You notice what just happened there? My flesh knows how to complain about interruptions when I'm busy and when I'm not busy. It's like, when would my flesh not complain? So I'm pretty sure that uh, my selfish nature doesn't think there's a good time to be interrupted. Maybe you guys are totally different and you're saying, oh, I just love it when my plans get thrown out of whack. I just, I just, I just love it when, when people come over and when I'm not planning. And, but that's not the way my body reacts. So today is one of those messages where the message is higher than the messenger. I, I know about love, and I want to be a loving person, but I don't always see it in my own heart. I don't always see it in my own heart. And I can do a couple different things. I can just ignore God. I can get really defensive and make excuses. Or I could fall on my knees before the living God, say, Lord, you are right, I'm wrong, and I want to be more like you. See, I'm not always the man God well, I'm not the man God wants me to be at all. And I'm not even the man I want to be. I see God's way. It's perfect. It's good. It's wonderful. Kind, loving, generous, full of grace, thankful, patient with everyone. Yeah, I want to be that. But I struggle. But I know who I want to be. I don't say, well, this is the way I am. Deal with it. I say, no, I want to be more like that guy that God wants me to be. And so I want to be able to humble myself and say, okay, God, time for confession, time to say you're right and I'm wrong, and then get on the right path once again. Because my selfish side is called selfish for a reason. 
because it's self-centered. It only looks inwardly. Everything revolves around ourselves. This is a burden to me. This is, this is a difficulty to me. This is going to cause trouble for me. The flesh is lazy. The flesh is wicked. You notice how the flesh can just sit around and really cuss out other people in our heart? Like, oh, man. And we can spend, we can waste a lot of time just really ticked off at people. You know, they shouldn't have treated me like that. They should know better. Well, how much time are we going to waste with that? Flesh is lazy. The flesh is wicked. The flesh is, you know, selfish. And it's just plain given to whining a lot. Uh, when, when we notice that in our heart, that whining, oh, poor me, and why do they, people have to do that to me, and what's, that's usually, like, not from God. Like, it's hard to imagine a context where that is from God. That poor me stuff. Am I the only person who knows how to complain in here? We all know how to do that, right? Thank you, John. I, we all knew you were good at that. Uh, no, no, no. Not true. John is, John is awesome. That whininess is not, the Bible talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You've got the Spirit of God in you. You're going to be loving and patient and gentle and kind. It never says you're going to be really good at complaining. That's just not of God. This complaining nature that is able to complain about no matter what happens. You notice, here's the flesh. This is simple. This is, here's the flesh. Oh, it's too cold. I can't wait to summer. Oh, man, I can't wait for things to cool off in the summer. Here's God. Thank you, Lord, for this beauty that you created. Look at the trees. They're sparkling like diamonds, and the ground is just white. Love it, Lord. Oh, thank you, God, for spring, all these flowers. Man, I just love it when it's warm outside and I can get out. Autumn, wow, all the different colors on the trees. You see the difference? What changed? Outside, everything is the same. The difference is what's going on between my ears, my attitude, how I respond. Romans 8, 5 through 8 says, For those who are according to the flesh, remember we talked about the flesh is self aside, those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is all about death. And you can think about death of joy, death of peace. I don't have any peace because I'm complaining all the time. Death of joy because I'm worrying all the time. Death of love and relationships because I'm always harping, I'm always negative, I'm always ripping down, I've always got something to complain about. But the mind set on God's spirit, the spirit, is life and peace. So then I got a choice. Well, I kind of like this, uh, I kind of like this death thing, you know. Kind of like being miserable all the time. So I think I'll just set my mind on, on selfish things and find a lot of reasons to complain about because then I will never be happy, guaranteed. Or we can say, wait a second, I could do with some peace. I need life. I've got to set my mind on the things of God, whatever is good and perfect and holy and wonderful. I've got to fill myself up with God. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. You ever notice that? Even though we go to church and we sing songs, you pray, but there's a part of us that gets hostile to God. God, don't touch this part of my life. God, and we find ourselves kind of trying to do the religious thing, but walling off God, <laughs> trying to ignore God, pretend he's not there. But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace because the mindset on the flesh is hostile towards God for it did not subject itself to the law of God. This is all about bending the knee. Am I going to bend the knee to culture? You know, do whatever the culture says? Am I going to bend the knee to my emotional roller coaster? Well, I got to do it because my emotions say I got to do it. Or am I going to humble myself and say, okay, you're God, I'm not. I know those guys ain't. <laughs> And so, Lord, I'm going to be obedient to you. Uh, the Bible says next in verse 7 there that the mindset on the flesh cannot even subject itself. It's not even able to humble itself to, to God. 
we need the Spirit of God. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's verse 8. So the flesh, again, is self-centered, and God wants us to put him first. Why? Why isn't it all about self and what's in it for me and, and i got to watch out for myself. I gotta, why isn't it about that? Because what is goodness anyways? Oh, you know, we say we sing the song, God, I need righteousness, I need holiness. What is that? Well, that's what comes out of God's character. What comes out of God's character is peace and joy and hope and love. And so when I'm turning my back to God, it's kind of like that old light side, dark side kind of thing. I turn my back to God and I get real caught up in myself right away. God says, put me first because everything good comes from me. And then when we're putting God, God first, because remember they came to Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, you've got to love God with everything. Your heart, soul, your mind. I mean, just everything inside you has got to love God. And then you're supposed to love other people the way he wants us to. Well, how does Jesus want us to love people? Well, he said, I was kind of willing to go out of my way for other people, right? I was willing to go to the cross for other people. You know, I heard something recently that kind of resonated with me. We all want to be growing spiritually. We want to be more like Jesus, have this good, loving, kind heart. But my old heart isn't getting better. It's not getting polished up. What we want is more of God in our lives, but the old nasty part, you can't dress it up. It's like, you know, what was that, putting lipstick on a pig or something? You can't dress up your old nasty heart. It stays old and nasty. Selfishness never gets pretty. Selfishness is always just going to be nasty. My sin nature is just as sinful as the day I was saved. Our fallen selfish hearts full of greed and lust and anger and self-justification, I can justify any nasty attitude, these things don't polish up. Instead, God wants his character to be growing within us. So these things get pushed off more and more to the side. So every true Christian feels this war inside of them, this conflict of natures. That's what the end of Romans chapter 7 is all about, the war that is always waging within us. But sometimes it's, it's more clear than others. And all too often, uh, I'm not feeding the dog. You know, that, that idea of there's two dogs fighting, which dog you want to win? Well, feed the dog that you want to win, starve the other dog. If I, want, if I want God's goodness to win in my life, I dwell on that. I contemplate the good things about God. But if I just want to be nasty and bent out of shape and gripe about people and be a complainer and, and put people down in my heart all the time, what am I going to do? I'm going to dwell on those things and feed the other dog, and it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger in my heart. I want to share you an example, though, uh, of, of when the Holy Spirit was, was winning and that was just a few weeks ago when I had this big old birthday party, and we invited the whole church out to the birthday party. I had such a wonderful time. I really, really, really enjoyed uh, you guys just coming and talking and, and, and eating. And uh, I still, if, here's the thing, you know, I didn't just have a birthday party and forget about it. I still think about it. I mean, you only get one a year. You might as well appreciate it for six months and anticipate the next one for the next six months. But, but, I mean, I just think about how good, and I look sometimes at some of the pictures that were taken and just so glad to see everybody there uh, surrounded by people that uh, love you. But, you know, these things are, are pretty tiring. I mean, even when you're loving it and enjoying it, it can wipe you out. First, you have to clean uh, for a few days, I mean hours, uh, before uh, the party. And uh, fun itself is tiring. And on the day of the party, on the day of the party when we're having this big, huge time and, and everybody's starting to dwindle out, you know, it's just right at the end of the party, there's just a few people milling around and, and we're looking forward, it's just going to be you, me, and I, and my kids, and we're going to kick back and I was going to open presents. And a phone rang. And I uh, got a phone call, and a gal in, in Beloit uh, didn't have a place to stay that night. And, and my flesh immediately said, oh, man, I was going to open presents. And, and I knew right away, it was just like God, 
I knew right away uh, what we need to do, and I've got, uh, Yumi's not here so I can embarrass her, I have the best wife in the world. I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I said, honey, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've called Dwayne's wife and said, a homeless person is coming to stay with you guys tonight. And, and Yumi, again and again, has just said yes. And, and I say, can you clean up the back bedroom quick? And, and honestly, usually, what people want is you to give them money for a hotel. And a lot of times, people end up not staying with us. Sometimes they do, but a lot of times they don't. But Yumi always, always just says yes. And, and I just am so appreciative for that. I've got a, a wife that understands and, and puts up with that. So I got off phone, and I said, I asked Yumi, I, you know, can we have somebody over tonight? And she said yes. And uh, she needs a place to stay. So Yumi and I hop in the car. Kids stayed at home. Uh, to go get this gal, they're cleaning, the kids are cleaning the house. And then we don't always have the opportunity to serve, but that time we could, and I had this feeling that God was pleased. And I really, really want my kids to kind of see that, you know. I want my kids to see mom and dad willing to go out of their comfort zone. I want my kids to see mom and dad doing that was not my plan. I wanted to open presents. But loving people in the name of Christ, that's good. And that doesn't mean my flesh didn't complain about it, though. It doesn't mean that inside I didn't have to pray my way through it, that there wasn't things I had to work on. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 9 right now. Matthew chapter 9, 14 to 38. <clears throat> okay, we're going to do Matthew chapter 9, 14 to the uh, end of the chapter. Then John's disciples came. So these are the disciples of John the Baptist. The followers of John the Baptist came to Jesus and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees, we fast all the time, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom, Christ is talking about himself, because the bride remembers the church, he's the bridegroom. The bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast. He's talking about when he dies on the cross and then resurrects, but then goes back to heaven. No one sews a patch of unshrunken cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do the people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. While he was saying this, so Jesus, what's Jesus doing? He's teaching. He's got, he's got work to do. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader, an official, that kind of a head of a church, a Jewish church, came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died. Or, or the language is fuzzy there, could be, is dying. My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her, and she will live. Look at verse 19. So Jesus started complaining and said, Oh, man, I was just teaching, and I was going to go eat, and I need to sleep. Oh, wait, no, that's not in my Bible. Verse 19, I better just stick to the text. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. So he's on his way to this other place to go bless somebody. Just then, so as he's on the way, just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned to her and saw her, take heart, daughter. So again, he's interrupted. And what's his response? It's love. Take heart. It means be encouraged. Take heart, daughter. Your faith. Uh, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and the people playing pipes. So again, end of a long day. He's tired. This was not his plans. He's going, he's interrupting, he gets there and there's all these people and there's, there's pipes and there's a huge crowd. And uh, he said, go away. <laughs> the girl is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. So great you know you're going out of your way to help somebody out because you are full of love and people are laughing at you par for the course 
After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this miracle spread throughout that region. As Jesus went from there, (laughs) wow, wow. So as he's going from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Do you guys think I, I can do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. And he touched their eyes and said, just like you believe, it's going to happen that way. According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly. He warned them sternly. So he just did this for him. He's gone out of his way. It's just one interruption after another. He warns them sternly. Now listen, see to it that you don't tell anybody about this. But they went out and spread the news about him in that entire region. So first people laughing at him. Now people ignoring him. While he was going out... (laughs) A man who was demon-possessed, like, you know you have a bad day. I mean, you're busy, and interruption, interruption, interruption. What? Great. Now what can happen? Demon-possessed guy. So as he was going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, because Jesus can do whatever he wants, demons can't fight with God. When the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed. And said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, these religious hypocrites, these religious self-righteous people, said, it's by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. So now, after he's done all this service, because he loves people, going out of his way, people say, oh man, you're like, de- you're like influenced by demons. Totally misunderstanding his heart. Have you ever done something to help somebody else out? <laughs> And your motives are totally misunderstood. People call you a bad guy. They think you're a bad guy, even as you're trying to bless somebody. Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues. So he's going everywhere, all the towns, all the villages, walking all this in synagogues, proclaiming there's good news, the kingdom. Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. God's kingdom is coming into our hearts. And healing every disease and sickness. And the reason he healed these diseases was to point people towards him. The reason we do good works is to point people to Jesus, bring them to Jesus. And when he saw the crowds, he said, oh, man, I'm just way tired. Wait, I was making that up. Let's check what it says. Verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What about the crowds of people that didn't understand him? What about the people that were angry with him? What about the people that wanted to nail him to a cross? What about Jesus saw him and said, man, sin has messed over these people. These, these poor folks, they're harassed. Their life is complicated and complex, and they've got all these issues and all these worries, and they're afraid of the future and everything. And God has compassion on them. Then he said to his disciples, these 12 guys with him, he says, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The harvest. There's a lot of people we can bring to Jesus. There's a lot of people we can introduce to God, but there's not enough people who are willing to get off their butts and go love people in the name of Jesus Christ. Ask the Lord of the harvest. Pray, therefore, send out workers into this harvest field. And look at, we see this at the end of this long passage about Jesus going out of his way to be a blessing to others. Teaching the people around him, he's interrupted. You know, he was interrupted by sickness. I've never once gotten sick and said, oh, this was a good time to be sick. Sickness is not convenient. Real life is not convenient. When, when, we are, when our Astro van got hit by a car, that wasn't a convenient time to get hit. Oh, thank goodness I got hit now. Real life hardship, troubles, never convenient. Never on our schedule. Uh, Next week, Tuesday, I think uh, we'd like a meteor to hit our house, you know, or something. It's never on our schedule, never a good time. Someone needs help. And Jesus really did have other important things to do, didn't he? He was teaching. He was doing good things. Do you think maybe Jesus was tired? 
Well, the Bible says he was just like us except without sin. God came and put on human flesh. He was just like us. You need to take a shower. You need to eat. Yeah, he was tired. He was wiped out. I wonder if Jesus felt like saying, sorry, I did not get a good night's sleep last night, so forgive me if I'm not very loving today. Wow. Jesus? See, that, that's something we would say. That's not something God would say because God is perfectly loving and we are less than perfectly loving. So then we got to say, well, I'm going to settle for being loving. Or we got to say, no, I want to be more loving. Even if I'm never going to make it in this life, I want to be going God's direction. Oh, man, I'm just really hungry. And, and, and I, I heard uh, Thomas is over there making some pancakes. <laughs> Sorry, there is no way I can help you folks right now. I just get so weak, and I kind of get cranky. I'm not myself. And, and I, I'd, get, I'd get sick on the way over there anyways, riding on a donkey or something. So I'd probably just hurl. So, You know, can you imagine Jesus talking like that? Because that's the way I feel like talking sometimes. You guys are all sing, sitting there thinking, well, you're the only one like that, right? No? So Jesus answers yes while he's teaching. And on his way, because of one interruption, he's interrupted again. Then he finally gets to where he's going. There's this noisy crowd there. And a crowd of people who do not know what's going on, do not know his heart, don't know that he just left something important, traveled all the way there to help because he cares, they start laughing at him. And they don't even really know who he is. If they did know who he is, they would have fallen on their feet before him because that's the only reasonable thing to do before Christ, say, oh, you are God. I fall at your feet. So they laugh at him. Then when he's done there, two more people get on him and he helps them. And then a demon-possessed guy comes and look how people respond to Jesus. As he was going out of his way, wearing himself out physically, all to bless others, when he could have stayed with his friends, look at how the people treat him. Let's go over this one more time. In addition to the string of interruptions, Jesus gets laughed at while going out of his way for others. At verse 24, he gives a clear, stern instruction to the two blind men that he heals not to talk about people. Come on, I've just busted my butt to help you. And, and I said, don't tell anybody that I just lent you 20 bucks because then everybody's going to ask him. And you run out and tell everybody that I just got 20 bucks. He gives a clear instruction not to talk about it. And they go and do talk about it. They disobey him. Uh, spread the news, it says, to the entire land. So the entire region gets information. It's verse 31. That's two. And then to top it all off, yeah, as he's blessing difficult people. He's blessing difficult people. Isn't that the key here? When we're loving people that love us, that's, that's nice. That's not particularly difficult. You don't need God in your life to be nice to people that are nice to you. Anybody can do that. I think Mao could probably do that. Anybody can, can treat nicely the people around them that treat them nice. But Jesus was treating difficult people and denying himself for the sake of others. He was loving difficult people. And that's something we need God in our lives or the Holy Spirit in our lives for. A bunch of religious people get together and talk about how evil he is, how, how demonic he is. Boy, being religious doesn't really mean you're close to God, does it? Wow, what a day. Yet Jesus stays focused on his mission. He stays focused on the needs of others, and how is that possible? Well, there's a couple things that came to mind. One is that in Many portions of the New Testament, we see that Jesus always takes time out to talk with his dad in heaven. Uh, prayer. Jesus goes and, and speaks with his father. But there's another secret, and I want you to look at verses 35 and 36 again. Chapter 9, 35 and 36. Jesus was going through all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. He's going everywhere and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them. He didn't see them as trouble. He didn't see them as a pain. He didn't see people as interruptions. 
he saw them and he felt compassion because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. You want to try to be a Christian without really love? Compassion? It won't please God. How often we just want to talk about our own problems? How often we, we're, we want people to hear our problems, but we don't want to listen to other people? How, how often do we, we don't really spend time praying for other people? It won't please God, and we will not serve well or be much use to the kingdom of God. Life is just one big inconvenient interruption from the day you're born to the day you check out. Love, by definition, is not convenient, and there are a lot of inconvenient, often ungrateful people who need someone to leave their comfort zone to love them to share the love of Christ with them. Because their best chance, the, a lot of people, their best chance to see that God is real and that love is real is if you and I answer God's call. Because God's, God's saying, boy, boy, the harvest, it's white. It's ready. But nobody wants to get off out of their chairs, out of their bed. Nobody ever wants to go and love people. Go out into the harvest, answer the call. People's best chance to see God is when he's loving them through us in unnatural way. When we have to deny ourselves, God say, not my will, God, but your will be done. A supernatural way, a way that is beyond our natural capacity. When I love people beyond selfish Dan Wolf, that shows God. When we just do our own thing, that doesn't show anything. That's a Holy Spirit kind of love. When people say things that tick us off, and instead of, we think, how can I bless this person? Because I don't want them to go to hell. This is more about my pride. This is something bigger than my comfort zone. This is about eternal souls that God loves and Jesus died for, and I'm too lazy to care, or I'm too selfish to care, or I'm too filled with, this to care. Holy Spirit, you got to change me. I'm so glad. You know, before Jesus went to that cross, I am so, so glad. He didn't say, now, is Dan grateful enough? Man, that sin kind of disgusts me. Uh, he's difficult. He didn't spend enough time with me. He didn't care about me. You're going to write him off because that's exactly what we do to people all the time. Ha, huh, their sin, man, that just freaks me out. Those kind of people, no way. Or I've tried to be nice to them, but they don't. God says, yeah, I've been trying to be nice to you too. You want to pay attention? If God didn't write me off, how the heck can I write other people off? If he died for me and I say, I love you, Jesus, but I hate those creeps that you died for, what does that mean? Don't do the Holy Spirit dodge on me. This is a hard message. Are we going to say yes to God or are we going to keep saying yes to our selfishness? We've got to get on our knees and say, okay, God, enough of me. I know how to mess things up. It's got to be more about you. God is real. He can really do something different in our lives if we'll open up. God plants his fields that he wants us to harvest. He plants them with selflessness, and he harvests them with love. And he looks at this world, this world that we're fed up with, and he looks at us. He said, you're my child, right? Yeah, Dad. You want to come to work with me? Okay. Okay. And Jesus goes out to love people. And we either go to work with Dad, we say, nope, too busy, Dad. That's an old video game controller, if you didn't know what I was doing. That went over some people's heads. He turns to us and says, you know, 
There's a lot of harvest out there, my son or my daughter. A lot of people out there need Jesus. A lot of people out there need to be loved. A lot of people out there need to find God. The fields are white. Coming with? Coming with me? Let's go love some people. And we got to decide. Can I say yes to my selfish, lazy, ornery, hard-headed, self-righteous side? I'm going to say yes, God. You're, everything you're about is good. Everything you're about is good. Everything you're about is good. And I want to do that because I'm sick of this. Amen? Matthew, I'm going to read it one more time. 36 through 38. Seeing the people. He saw the people. Sometimes we don't even see them. We don't see people suffering around us. We don't see people burdened and weary around us. He saw the people. He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I want this to be a church full of people that says, okay, we'll serve. Okay, God, we'll do it. The kingdom of God needs less spectators and more players out on the field. People will not just sit on the bench but say, coach, put me in. People are not just going to take care of people's physical needs, although that's important, but we bless people in order to show them what they really need, and that's Jesus Christ who died for their sins. And heaven's gates are open wide, and everybody can go to heaven. If they say, Lord God, please forgive me. I want to be part of you. I want to be a part of what you're doing. Let's strive to bring people close to Christ. Jesus could have snapped his fingers, right, and healed everybody in the world. The reason he was healing people was to draw attention to himself because he was going to die for their sins. It's easy for us to be so high and mighty and disgusted with other kinds of people, other people's sins, so that we won't even love them anymore. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus, you didn't treat me that way. Thank you, Jesus, you didn't treat me the way I often treat other people. Brothers and sisters, we've got a wonderful, wonderful Savior. Look at the way he loved people. Look at how he went to the cross for you and me. And he says, come on, you're not going to live that long anyways. Why don't you use your life up loving other people? Why don't you use your life being part of my kingdom plan of bringing people close to God? Showing them what the cross means, what love looks like. Forgiveness, peace, truth, justice, mercy, everything good. You know what? The workers are few. Even people who say they believe in Jesus say no to him on a daily basis. Let's be a church. Let's work at it. I mean, we know we're not perfect, but let's really work at saying yes to God. Lord God, let's pray right now. Lord God, uh, here we are. And we want to follow you every day. And we want you to use us. Lord, there's so much reaction inside of us, gut reaction, knee-jerk reaction, where we just get upset with people. We want to say no to people. We want to write people off. But God, uh, your Holy Spirit's showing us a better way. We saw in your Bible, Jesus, uh, you living out a better way. And then you call us to follow you. So God, help us to follow you and help us to really, really, really uh, love people more than we love our own pride or our own comfort zone. Thank you, God, for giving us this call to a better life, a, a life with purpose and meaning, a, a life where we get to do something really valuable, bring people to heaven, love people. Uh, God, thank you for this call and help us to say yes to this uh, way more than we have been doing, Lord. Uh, help us to just be like Jesus. Pray this in your name. Thank you, God. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.